I know, I know. You guys thought they called in the big guns. Maybe somebody from out of town. I used to be from out of town. I was in Nashville for a while. So hopefully, maybe this counts as a guest speaker from Nashville, if you guys are really feeling it. <laughs> um, but wow, it is my honor, just like Jacob said, to, to bring the word of God today. Uh, it's my honor um, because nobody is worthy of getting, let alone seeing the word of God and reading it, but even getting to bring it to other people. Like the, like the word of God is the word of God. I never want to take that for granted and let myself become so self-righteous and egotistical that I, I would think that I am worthy outside, because Christ makes us worthy, amen? You know, like Christ makes us worthy, but I just don't want to carry myself with any kind of arrogance when it comes to God and his word. Um, so thank you guys for coming. Thank you guys for being willing to sit here and listen and hear the word of God being preached. Uh, it is a bit of a smaller service, as you can tell. A lot of people um, are either out of town or, you know, obviously, you know, there's the, there's the marriage retreat. Um, but as I recall, the first century church met at houses, so it was always small. <laughs> I, I don't want us to get used, so used to big church that we forget that, hey, the first people who ever did it did it small. So we have to learn how to sit and in love and enjoy these moments of, of just intimacy with each other. We're close, you know what I mean? It's, it is closer to be like this. Um, and today's topic, I think how fitting that it is a smaller group. Because today's topic, I believe, is one of depth and intimacy with God, yet also zeal and expression. 25% sure. I know how to work this. Oh, I was way off. Oh, oh, man, that was tough. <laughs> We're going to preach weight in the water. Oh, shoot. Let me go back. <laughs> like, all right. Nobody, nobody look at that slide. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about devotion. We're going to be talking about, in particular, the devotion that, that God describes in his word, the devotion that he desires from each of us. Before we go too far, though, I feel like devotion, if I'm being honest, is one of those words that we, it's like one of those words that everybody thinks they know. We all think we know how to use it, and we do, but I often think a lot of us misunderstand what it's supposed to mean. Um, in essence, it's easy to toss words around and use them, but we actually don't know what they fully mean. Um, I'll give you an example. There was one time, my mom never lets me live this down. I majored in biomedical sciences. I learned a lot of biological words, right? But I was trying to use a big word to impress my family one night. We were driving through this Christmas light thing. And I said, oh, wow. I don't know how this came up. It was, it was really dumb. But I was like, man, look at the anatomical structure of that deer. And it was like a fake deer, right? Now, anybody who's in biology knows that that doesn't make sense to use the word anatomical when talking about an inanimate object. It makes zero sense at all. It's about living objects. Like that, that, my statement made no sense, but obviously somehow my mom knew what that word meant and has never let me live it down because every time we have an argument, she brings it up. Uh, but it's not, but I'm not the only one who tries to use big words and say, so, oh, oh, I know what it means. Yes, let me use the antiquitous of this and whatever we're trying to use. And so I, I just want a random volunteer. Can I get one person to raise their hand? One person? All right, Evelyn. Evelyn, in your loudest voice, can you tell me what the word inflammable means? Inflammable? See, you would, you would think, right? It actually, it actually means it's easily catching on fire. That's the definition right there, easily set on fire. That's crazy. You probably even used that word in sentences, and no, one, and no one's ever corrected you, right? because we all think we know what these words mean sometimes. All right, I need another volunteer. I need another volunteer. Anthony, what does the word redundant mean? Shout it as, as loud as you can. Yeah, hey, fair. actually that was it. I think most people assume it means like, like repetitive. Oh, you repeated it. Like it's, oh, it's redundant. You keep using it. It actually just means something that 
has it's no longer needed. It's not useful. It's useless. So the statement doesn't even need to be repeated to be useless. It could be redundant without being repeated. All right, one more person. Let me get one more. Who's feeling it, Ruby? How good is your vocabulary, Ruby? Because I don't know if I like where this is going. No, it's fine. I think Ruby knows vocabulary really well, so I just don't want to like get caught. What does the word travesty mean? Travesty. What does travesty mean? Yell in your loudest voice. Yes. See, people think that's what it means. <laughs> got her. Got her. Guys, this whole sermon was used to set up Ruby. No, there's actually no sermon. I'm just saying. Church was actually at 10 a.m. We just set up a fake service just to set Ruby up for this prank. No, I'm just playing. I'm just playing around. Um, travesty actually means a false or distorted representation of something. Oftentimes, people will use it to mean equate tra to tragedy, but that it's not always the case, if not ever truly the case. It's just an absurd, um, an absurd, what is it? Representation of something. Uh, we use big words, and I think that devotion can be the same. We can toss around devotion uh, almost like some kind of badge of honor. You know, if you remember this meme, do you even lift, bro? A lot of people used to say this, and a lot of people, a lot of people with gym egos used to be like, come on, bro, do you even lift? Like, can you even do that? But how many times in the religious world do we go, are you even devoted, bro? Like, do you even know what devotion is, man? I'm devoted. Are you? And we just throw that word around. It's like this word that we just love to toss around. Or, or maybe we use it to make ourselves even feel better. Like, yeah, I'm devoted when we're giving half an effort. Um, what does that word truly mean is the question. Um, are you giving everything you got or just giving what you're willing to give? What does God actually require? What does God ask for? Um, I have a question. Should we strive to just be devoted in any capacity that we understand it? Or should we strive to be devoted the way that he describes it, meaning God? The way that he desires it and the way that he is devoted to us. There is a massive difference between the two. And it's obvious the more you look at the scriptures that there is an incredible difference between those two. Um, when I look at my own life, I don't know if it's just blindness or plain laziness, but I often find myself giving myself the excuse of, I gave everything I had, I gave what I could. And there are a lot of times, you know, you see me on stage, I give everything I got. But it, the question is, is that what he wanted? Does it matter if I give everything if it's the wrong thing? Are, are we willing to dig into our hearts to actually ask and look what, he, what he's asking for, what he desires? It's all about him. When we said Jesus was Lord, when I laid my life before the cross that Jesus is Lord, it's about him. It doesn't matter what I consider devoted. Who cares if I think going to church every Sunday means devoted if God doesn't think that means devoted? Who cares, like, if I am giving my money to the poor, but I'm treating with disrespect and gossip and dishonor my brothers and sisters in the church. Like, what does it matter if we're only giving half of what we think devotion means, but we're missing what God actually calls it to be? And I just think it's something that I don't want us to miss because it's so vital in our faith. This is part of the key to making it all the way through the rest of our lives because something I desire for all of us in this room and even everybody who's not in this room and, and something that I know for a fact God desires is that we get to be with him when it's all said and done. It's not about being faithful for a few years. It's about being faithful forever. And if your devotion is not, if your devotion is not centered on what, the way he describes it, it will burn out as we will see. Um, but how can we know? How on earth can we possibly know what devotion fully means? Well, you got to ask and you got to look. Uh, I would encourage each and every one of you to not let this be the only time you reflect on this. Go to God in prayer this week. Spend every day, seven days, the next seven days, just 
pray for 30 minutes. Ask God, what do, God, what does devotion look like for me, Father? Pray just every day for 30 minutes. And yeah, we don't have to, but I'm just throwing it out there. Like, why let this be the only place that we, that we do this? And just beg him, plead with him. Show me, God, I want to see, I want to see you. It's not about me, it's about you. You know, not you guys, but God, you know, it's about God. Um, and then you got to go look for it. You can't just pray and then expect a pigeon to come by with the scripture. Like, you got to go look inside the word of God for it. We have to go seek these things out. And so I just want to explore a little bit with you guys, just a little bit of Psalm 63. A closer look at devotion. This is just one scripture. If you guys want to open up your Bibles to Psalm 63, it'll also be up here if you don't have a Bible. That's okay. And we're going to take, we're going to take a little look, a glimpse at what God considers to be devotion. Psalm 63, verse 1. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. You got to break this down. <laughs> this is a lot. It's juicy. And I'll be honest with you, I have a lot of questions for God about this passage. It's only a few words, but man, I have so many questions. God, what does it mean to, what does it really mean to, to for my being to long for you? Is that 24-7? Does it, does it come and go? Like, you know, because sometimes I'm an emotional guy, so I want to know how things should feel. So I always ask God those questions. God, what does it mean for me to, like, thirst for you? Like, how should that feel? Should it feel like this burning fire? Or, or is it just something I need to know and put into practice? Is my thirst something I need to know and put into practice? Um, but first off, I love how David starts by proudly proclaim, proclaiming, God, you are my God. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. David is proud to know that he serves the one true God. David is not, like, he's not cowarding away from it. He's not scared of it. He loves his God. Um, and that's part of devotion. Part of devotion is knowing who we serve and being proud of it. Not shying away from God. The truth is in our culture right now, it's very easy to shy away from it. And shying away from it, we can justify by being like, oh, well, I'm being loving. I just don't wanna like inflict my views on somebody. And there is a time, right? You know, when we have to be restrained sometimes from like kind of, ah, oh, you're wrong. And just going at, you know, going at it. Like there is a time and a place for that. But how often do we justify you know, somebody comes in and, and starts saying something about God, like, man, the Bible was written 2,000 years ago. How can that really mean anything for people nowadays? Like, it, you know, it, it was for their culture. Like, the Bible was very cultural. It was for the, for the Jewish culture. It's not really meant for us. Well, am I going to sit there and let someone say something blatantly false about the Word of God? Because that's not true. The Bible actually says it's alive and active. Or am I, in a loving way, am I going to say, hey, actually, it's alive and active. If you want to find out what that means, I would love to show you because I've seen in my life how it works. I've seen in my life how the Bible is very, very active for someone in the modern 2024. Um, or am I going to shy away and be like, oh, you know, I, it's not that big of a deal, God. It's just your word. It's the word of God. Am I proud? Am I proud to follow God? What about when people say, oh, man, like, like, oh, why does it matter to God? Like, why does it matter to God who we marry and who we date? It matters to God who we marry and who we date. <laughs> Um, some might say it doesn't, but the scriptures would blatantly tell you you're lying. It matters. Um, and so are we going to stand up for that? Or are we going to shy away and be like, oh, you know, just love who you want, do whatever you want. It's okay. You know, you can worship God and do whatever you want. Um, I think there's an aspect of our devotion where we need to stand up and say, no, nah, not, not in like a grab a picket fence and go out down Mill Avenue and, and you know, <laughs> start telling people, yeah, you guys need to, you know, what I'm saying is, are you proud to declare the word of God? Even if you're scared, fear is not the issue. It's overcoming the fear and saying, no, God, I need to say something. I cannot, I cannot sit here and let people misrepresent you and let somebody speak falsely about you because you are God, my God. That is part of devotion. And the other part, going back to our, you know, going back to what this means is, is 
I thirst for you. I earnestly seek you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. You could spend so long thinking about what that means. I don't even know if I'll ever grasp that in my lifetime what that means. But it is our job to try. It is our responsibility to our relationship with God to really try to figure this out and really go after this. Because this was a man after God's own heart that said this. So obviously it means something to God. This is what God wants. You ask yourself, you know, like, we're in a parched land. We're in this dry and parched land. Speaking of parched land, guys, there was one time me and my family loaded up a cargo van, went down to the dunes, this awesome dune buggy. We spent all day driving this dune buggy, right? But it's hot outside. So we're packing up. We're getting ready to leave. You know, we went out there early in the morning. We're leaving. And I, I feel bad. I'm going to put my dad on the spot here. But we're, we're, we're driving, and we see a sand patch. And it was like, hey, should we go? Should we drive through it or find a way around it? I just remember my dad full sending that thing through the sand patch. We didn't make it through the sand patch. <laughs> we got stuck. And we were there for like hours, like hours and hours and hours till at night. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm pretty sure the tow truck who came to get us got stuck and they had to send another tow truck. I don't know. My parents might tell you more about that. I was like, I was a little bit younger. We had kids. Yeah, there, was, there was a lot going on. It was rough. So I will say this. I know what it means to be thirsty because that sucked. That was tough. Man, it's like, ah, oh, it's in your, your deepest being. You're like, I just want some water. Like, there's nothing else you want. There's nothing else you want than just a little bit of water. Like, that's what it means to thirst a little bit. That's what I've been convinced of, like, that feeling. Like, there's just nothing else I want. Is, at the end of the day, is God the only thing that you want? Is he enough for you? Or do you thirst for other things in the world? That doesn't mean you can't pursue other things like a good career. It doesn't mean that you can't go pursue things like friendships, like dating relationships, marriage. Like Those things are fine to pursue success. Those things are okay. But at the end of the day, what are you thirsty for? Like, what are you, what, in your inner being, at, when you go to bed at night, do you feel it inside your heart? We're like, God, I just want you. I could lose my job tomorrow, God. If I have you, I'm fine. I'm not willing to lose you for my job, God. I'm not willing to lose you for a relationship, God. I'm not willing to lose you for my family, God. I'm not willing to lose you for my friends, God. That, I think that's what it means to thirst for God. When you're just like, I, that's the only thing I want. <laughs> because when you're thirsty, water is the only thing that you want. It's the only thing you can think about. Let's keep going for the sake of time. <laughs> have more on that, but we're not going to go there. We're going to keep going. The Psalm 63, verses 2 through 4. What does he say? He says, I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. Ha diggity dog. That uh, is another scripture you got to really break down. How, like, that thing is full of stuff you could spend so long reflecting on. He says, I've beheld your power. Devotion is clinging to what we have seen and witnessed. Because if you don't, you will forget God very quickly. If you do not remind yourself every day of how good God is and the things that he has done, it is so easy to write off those things later in life when you're facing other challenges. All right, did God really come through for me that time or was it coincidence? Was that really God or did like someone just come and help me out of the goodness of their heart? Like, did I see God move powerfully or did I make it through because God pulled me through or did I make it through because I'm, I just kind of didn't quit? If we're not careful, when you first make it out of situations and you see God move, you have no choice. You're like, God, yes, you are glorious. You are powerful. I love you, God. Think about the Egyptian, or the Israelites. They saw the ocean break in half. And they were like, yes, God, you are the one true God. Oh, thank you, God. And man, not even a few days later, 
around 40 to be precise. <laughs> Moses is making his way down the mountain. And these are the same people worshiping a golden calf. What are we doing? What? How does that happen? Because they forgot what God did. They chalked it up to coincidence somehow. Well, the ocean just parted because maybe the weather was really good that day. If we're not careful, we don't remind ourselves that it is God working in your life. He's the one who sent that person to help you. He's the one who sent that extra money to help you. He's the one who delivered you. He's the one who got you through that health scare. If you don't remind yourself of those things and you're not devoted to that, reminding yourself, you will forget him and leave him and chalk it up to everything else in the world but him. It is part of our devotion to remember God. Why do you think Jesus calls us to take the bread and take the blood? Why would he command that? It's part of our devotion. Let's keep going. Psalm 63 verse 5. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. There's two things on here. One, I'm going to address because it's, it's a little less um, deep. God loves singing, guys. <laughs> I think whether you like to or not, whether you think you got a great voice or an absolutely tragic voice, you know, if you think your voice is a travesty, see, I don't know if that's the right use. You could maybe, I don't know. I don't even know how to use that word. It doesn't matter. It literally does not matter. If you're annoyed because the person next to you can't clap on beat, God loves that person singing. God would rather have them clap and sing than them be silent because it disrupts you. You know what? It, like, what are we doing? We, we should be singing to him. Giving everything we got, looking stupid. David looked so dumb for God. He looked so bad for God that his wife, McCall, res resented him for it. He came back dancing and having a good time. He's like, yeah, we won. Do the stanky leg. And he was like doing all kinds of stuff. And his wife was literally like, I hate that. Kings don't do that. You look like an idiot. But God loved it. Are we so prideful that we can't dance for God? On judgment day, are we going to sit before God with a solemn face? I don't think any of us are going to be sitting still on judgment day. We might be crying. I'll be real. Probably, probably be crying. <laughs> Because that's like, well, it's overwhelming. You'd be crying. <laughs> but after you're done crying, you're like, oh, I love you, God. <laughs> you see, you hit this thing, you're like, God loves singing. He loves dancing. But with that, too, it says, I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. I will be fully satisfied. <clears throat> this is for devotion to understand that God is our reward. In Genesis, when God is talking to Abraham, he says, I am your great reward. At the end of the day, is he enough for you? If everything else goes wrong, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12 says, a hope deferred makes the heart sick. What hopes of yours are making your heart sick? There's a lot of things that can make us feel unsatisfied with God. For some of it, it's health. Like, I'll be honest with you, that's tough. I've never had long-lasting health issues, but I'm a big baby when I'm sick. I'll keep it real. I was sick this past week. Your boy was sitting there like, I can't do anything. This stinks. Oh, and I was just whining and complaining for like three days straight. But for some of you, it's, it's long-lasting, and I'm sorry. I really am. Um, and I know God sees you. But is that hope of health being deferred, it, is that going to drive you away from being satisfied with him? Is the hope of, some of you might feel stuck in your careers right now. You just feel stuck in life, like, like you're not going anywhere. You feel like, man, I'm, I'm working every day. I'm working hard, but I have no goals. I have no ambition. Like sometimes the hope deferred of, like the, of the dreams that we had can just make us so sick. And we can, it, it can take away from all that we give to God. Because I'm stuck in my job, because I'm stuck in the season of life, because I'm stuck where I'm at right now, how much am I going to give my God? It, it, saps the, it saps the devotion from us. For some of us, 
It can be our singleness. I'm gonna put it out there. I hope deferred. Guys, my first five, my first six years of being a disciple, your boy was on a mission to avoid, to avoid being in the singles ministry because I wanted to be married. I was like, yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm going. Every ICMC, we're talking five, 10 dates, guys. We're going crazy. Every, every chance I had to take sisters on dates, I was like, I'm finding the one. And I'll be real with you. I had a couple of like pursuits where like I gave everything I had. I was trying my hardest. I'm going to be real. I'm not very smooth. I'm not very smooth in that regard. And so I tried my best. It wasn't great. <laughs> I gave my best. Um, and some of those really did end in some heartbreak. Like, it's, it really stinks when someone says, hey, I don't like you. It makes you feel like something's wrong with you. It stinks. Like, no one, no one enjoys that. In the kingdom, it's a lot better than it is in the world. But it still hurts. That's been my hope deferred. A lot of my hope can be deferred in that. And I think God's blessed me with a lot of contentment. But am I going to let that hope deferred sap my devotion away? Like, God, oh, because you won't give me a wife. Well, he never promised me one, first off. He never promised any of us a spouse. Let's just put that out there. <laughs> for all we know, it could be God's plan and his will for all of us to be single for the rest of our lives. But is that enough for you? Is he enough? Is he enough? I counted the cost on that. I'm willing to, I would rather be single for the rest of my life and with God than ever find the woman of my dreams and be away from him. I don't want it. I'm good, God. I love, I love you more than I love anything like that. I would rather be close to God doing right now just where I'm at than be successful and have everything that I think that I could ever want and be away from him. It's just not worth it. That's devotion. <clears throat> Let's keep it going, y'all. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night because you are my help. I sing in the shadow of your wings. There it is, singing again. He's singing. I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. And just for the sake of time, the thing that I want to focus on in this scripture, at the bottom of this scripture, guys, is I cling to you. What does it mean for us to cling to God? What does that really mean? I believe it means to persist in obeying God's word no matter what happens. To pray when you're too tired to pray. To go to the word when every morsel of your emotion says no. I would rather not. To continue to be vulnerable when you are tempted to be closed off and alone. To continue to love and serve when you have no strength to love and serve. And you're not doing it because you are forced to or because people are watching you and you feel obligated. It's because you trust that his right hand will uphold you. To persist in obedience has nothing to do with the fact that the eyes of everybody else is on us. If, if that is your reason for persisting in his obedience, that will fade very fast and you will grow very resentful of God and his people. But if it's because you trust him, if it's because you know that he is faithful and he will take care of you, he will take care of you. To persist in obedience is part of the unbelievable devotion that God calls us to and he asks us for. What else does Paul say? Paul says, but whatever regains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and the participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Paul gives us another demonstration of what devotion looks like in the scriptures. Devotion is considering everything that the world has to offer worthless. Do you still consider the things that you gave up for God worthless? 
Or have you begun to crave and seek those things once again? Whether you're a year old in Christianity or whether you're 30, have you allowed those things to actively find, your way, find a home back in your life? Have you actively sold yourself the lie that it's not that bad? It's not that bad, it's not that big of a deal. It was when you said Jesus was Lord. So what changed? We cannot allow our sinful nature to grip us again. We cannot allow the world to come after us and find its way back into our heart and our lives. Paul didn't. Paul stood the test of time and at the end he said, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. This was part of it. Everything is worthless. Everything that we could, we could desire, is, it's worthless. The sad part is some of us in this room will hear this and it will bounce right off our hearts. Our reaction to the passages may be numb, may be indifferent because we think, oh, I'm devoted. That's a dangerous game to play. <laughs> when the scripture doesn't cut because you think I'm already that thing, that's a very dangerous game to play. It doesn't mean that you have to be like, oh, I'm the worst, and you know, like, you don't have to beat yourself up. But to sit and let the word of God do what it's doing in your heart and to actually ask him, God, what are the areas of my life that I need to be more devoted? That's what we need. We need to fight for. Is this the devotion that God sees when he looks at your life? Does God see Psalm 63? Does God see Philippians 3? Is this it? Is your faith being built to last? How do you build a faith to last? I'm gonna go a little bit faster through this because I think I made this lesson a little bit longer than I intended. And that's okay, we're gonna go a little quicker. Why, you know what, that's real. He remembers the cooking lesson. I can't cook mac and cheese because I always leave it in the pot just a little too long. So why does this matter? It matters because Jesus warns us at that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Here's the truth. Jesus says the love of most will grow cold. If we are not careful, we will become the fulfillment of that scripture. If you are not careful with your devotion and your faith and you're not watching it tenderly like a fire, over the years, it will go terribly wrong. And it says the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. We gotta build our fire right. Are we content with this little baby fire right here that the lightest gust of wind, the most slight inconvenience will completely mess up our walk with God. Is that what your faith looks like right now? And I honestly, do me a favor guys, like really think about this. What does your fire look like right now? It could be a mix of either or, like, like, but it's some time for internal reflection. What does your fire look like right now? And please don't think about other people because I think some of us will be like, yeah, I know a brother whose fire looks like that. You know, like don't do that. <laughs> because that's where I think Satan tempts us to go. We always wanna help and fix other people, but we don't wanna, Take a look at our own heart and our own furnace. Is your fire this little one? A fire that honestly, like, it gives no warmth. Your faith, does your faith give warmth to other people? Or is it just a tiny little light that, yeah, you can see it if you squint? Yeah, I see it. It's there. <laughs> and when life gets hard, it goes out at times. And you have to keep, you have to just keep lighting it again, keep lighting it again, because it just keeps going out because it's so small. Or are some of us, is your faith and your zeal unchecked and untrained? The word of God says it's gonna train us. It's gonna teach us, correct us, and rebuke us in righteousness. Are you okay with just being on fire and full of opinion and religious opinion and zeal? Because you, that fire could become you right there, a forest fire. Nobody gets excited when they see a forest fire. <laughs> No one's like, oh man, finally warmth, yes. No, because they burn and they cripple the people around them. Are your religious opinions something of a forest fire where you just give your opinion without considering what Jesus would actually say and do? 
to where you're burning other people's lives around you. Faith that's small is not good. Faith that is that is unchecked and just it was just burning everything around it, that's also not great. We have to be very careful because the word is supposed to train us. Or is your fire like the third one? Something that draws people in, something that people want to be around. You see a campfire, you just want to hang around, your buddies come, all the buddies and the gals and the girls and the guys are, we're all gathering around the fire having a great time. That's what a campfire signifies. People love campfires because of that. Is your faith a campfire? Do people, do people come to you because they know you'll guide them to Christ? They know that your faith is rooted in the scripture. Is that something that someone can say about you? Is your zeal for God so great that you don't care what people think of you? Is that something people would see in your life? Something that shines light and brings warmth? Do you serve like no one's business? Do you serve your butt off for God? To the point of where you warm all the people around you with service. It's, it's wild. These are some of the things that I think that Satan will use to try and dim your fire and burn it out. Habitual sin. The bare minimum attitude. What's the bare minimum for my faith to make it to heaven? Paul even mentions this. A lot of this is even about salvation. You, you can still be saved. Paul says some of you will make it through. Some of you will make it to the end as though just escaping the flames. <laughs> Paul says that, like straight up. Paul is like, some of us will make it like that. <laughs> is that how you want to be? Like the guy who just, like, whoo, that was a close one. Oh, my goodness, guys, that was close. Why would you want to be like that when you could be so much closer to God? Why are we trying to be the bare minimum? The people we surround ourselves with. The truth is it doesn't matter if you don't like the same things as the people in the church. We are called to be closer to these people than ever before and anybody in our lives. You are supposed to be my family. I have to fight to be close to you. It doesn't matter if, if, if I like anime and nobody likes anime. It doesn't matter if I think, oh, I'm the odd man out and I'm a weirdo and nobody wants, likes the things that I like. It doesn't matter. We have to fight to find what unifies us. God is not going to sit there at the judgment day and say, ah, oh, I see what happened. It's okay. You, you disobeyed my word because it was too hard and you were, you were an oddball. That is, like, God's not going to say that. We have to surround ourselves with godly people and unanswered prayers. Once again, go back to 12, Proverbs 12, 13, 12. Unanswered prayers can dim our fire. They can hurt. But we got to keep praying. What keeps us going for the sake of time? I'm going to read this quickly. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. It's him. If nobody is there by your side, God is. If you are the only one running this race, he's still there with you. Running a marathon alone is probably the worst thing you could ever try and do. Because what happens when your mental fortitude is gone? When you're like mile 13, you're already gassed, your legs hurt, you don't think you can go anymore. If you're alone, you're going to stop running. If you have nobody there to encourage you, you're going to stop running. But if you have a partner with you who's always encouraging you, running alongside you, saying, don't quit. Come on, I got you. I'm going to carry you. Let's go. We got to keep going. We got to keep going. That's what God promises to be. You are never alone. Even if everybody else around you abandons you, you are never actually alone. He is with you. He keeps you going. You cannot run this marathon without him as your partner running with you. Your validation comes directly from God Almighty. Our validation does not come from the people around us and the people around us clapping and, and doing anything. The truth is, you can walk away and everybody could never say anything and compliment you ever. But God compliments you. He laid his life down for you. He gave everything for you. He is with you. He promised he would be. Some of us think Christianity looks like this. You know, okay, the world's walking that way. I'm going to go this way. But in reality, it looks like this. I don't know if you can see it, but Jesus, like, like Jesus is with us. You're, you're a child. You're his child. Why would he leave you? He would never leave you. That's what Christianity can look like more accurate than, than this. That's so lonely and depressing. <laughs> that is the image we, we fight for. But what if I told you 
there's just a t like two minutes more. <laughs> because it's not all doom and gloom and just hard work and nothing. In fact, God says, and without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. There is so much reward in being devoted to God. It's not all just heartache and, and sickness of heart. I think sometimes we get so focused on some of those things, but we forget about the reward. Take a picture of that real quick. Those are just a few of the promises that God promises us. Just a few of the rewards of devotion. Just a few. The Bible's full of them. And you know what's wild? God doesn't owe you any of those things. He gives you these things because he absolutely adores each and every one of you. It reminds me of my sisters. I, like, guys, I'm a grown man. I don't have no business going to Claire's. Anybody know what Claire's is? It's a store. I, I'm a grown man. I've got no business in there. But every time I go to the mall, because, hey, I'm going to keep it real. I walk around the mall and play Pokemon Go sometimes. I'm going to keep it real. I go out there alone. It's my day off. I just kind of do my own thing. So, but every time I pass a Claire's, I go to the clearance section just to see if there's anything I can buy my sisters that's cheap. Because sometimes they have crazy deals like 5 for $10. I'm like, dude, yeah, what? That's like 80% off. What are we doing here? Yes. Now, am I doing it because my sisters won the Trophy of the Year award or because my sisters, oh, they just gave me 500 bucks the other day, so I have to pay them back? <laughs> like, no. They're right there. They're little. It's Elise and Aria. They're tiny. Like, they didn't earn or, or owe anything. I just love them so much, I want to reward them for my love for them. I just love them so much that I just want to surprise them with little weirdo stuff so that they can feel happy when they see me. It's the way God treats you. You're his child. God, like You didn't earn any of it. God just loves to reward you. He just loves to shower you with gifts. It's true. It's a fact. He says it. It's impossible to please God unless you actually believe that. That's the crazy part. You cannot please God unless you believe that he wants to reward you. Isn't that wild? Like, why would God say that? Unless he wanted you to know how much he loves you and cherishes you. But the best reward of all is to know Christ. To know him, to know the God Almighty, the God of the universe, is the best thing you could ever do. And so fight the good fight. Finish the race marked out for you. Keep the faith, please. I want to see all of us in heaven one day. I want to make it. And I want to be like, Nacho, we did it, bro. <laughs> bro, I'm not going to lie. There were a few close calls, but we did it. You know, I want to get to heaven and me and Anthony are out there doing the stanky leg. And then, and then Violet and, you know, and Grace show up and they're like, oh, dang, let's go. You know, like, but like, isn't that what you want? Don't you want to make it? Tanya, John, Lauren, Kendra. Like, do you guys, I was going down the line, I was debating on if I should say it. I was like, should I finish? And I was like, that's awkward. I was like, I'll just, I'll finish. But, like, like, I love you guys. You're my sisters. You're my brother. You're my sister. Like, why wouldn't I want to celebrate with you in heaven? This is why this is so important. None of this matters unless you make it. You could be faithful 99 years and then leave the last year. And what did it matter? You have to build your devotion strong so that you can make it, so you can fight the good fight, finish the race, and we can all do the stanky leg in heaven. I love you guys with all my heart. Hope you have a great night. I'm going to invite Anthony back up just to have a quick close.